And before we go tonight, we want to mark the passing of a legend of rock and roll. Tom Petty died last night at the age of 66. He is one of the best-selling music artists of all time. No, you don't know how it feels to be me. Tom Petty died on October 2nd, 2017, while he was surrounded by his friends, family, and bandmates. He had this incredible career that spanned over four decades. However, there's so much more to Petty's story than what you might read in his obituary. So let us fill you in on some of the highlights of Tom Petty's life and career. Tom's Early Life Tom Petty was born on October 20, 1950, in Gainesville, Florida. His parents were Kitty Petty and Earl Petty, and Tom was the eldest of two sons, with his brother Bruce being seven years younger. They grew up in the Duck Pond neighborhood, which was later marked with a historical marker in honor of Tom after his passing. Plus, they even renamed a nearby park to Tom Petty Park. When it came to his education, Tom went to Howard Bishop Middle School, where he became part of Little League Baseball and Basketball. Then he moved on to Gainesville High School and graduated in 1968, and that's where his journey into music really started to take off. Fascinatingly, Tom had always been a fan of music. His love for rock and roll started when he was just 10 years old. This was the time when he got the chance to meet Elvis Presley. His uncle had been working on the set of one of Presley's films nearby and invited Tom to check out the filming. He got to be that close to the king of rock and roll at such a young age, so he was instantly hooked on Presley's music and even traded his whammo slingshot for a bunch of Elvis records. He later described meeting Presley as something magical, saying that Elvis glowed. Then, in 1964, when Tom saw the Beatles perform on The Ed Sullivan Show, he knew he wanted to be in a band. Seeing the Beatles rock out on television showed him that making music with your friends could be the coolest thing ever. Tom wasn't into sports much, but music was his thing. He realized he could do what the Beatles were doing, and eventually he did exactly that. Soon, garage bands were popping up all over the place, and Tom was right in the middle of it. Don Felder, who later joined the Eagles, was one of Tom's first guitar teachers. Later on, Tom said that Felder taught him piano instead of guitar, but either way, it's clear that Tom was surrounded by musical talent from a young age. As a young adult, Tom worked for a bit on the ground crew at the University of Florida, although he never actually attended the university as a student. There's a famous Ojichi lime tree on campus that some say Tom planted when he worked there. They even call it the Tom Petty tree now, but here's the thing. Tom himself couldn't remember planting any trees during his time there. He also had a brief job as a grave digger, which adds to the mystery and intrigue of his early life. At that time in his life, nobody could imagine the star that he was about to become. The Heartbreakers Era After Tom Petty had set his sights on a music career, he started with a band called The Epics, which later turned into Mudcrutch. Some familiar faces from Mud Crutch were Mike Campbell and Benmont Tench, who later joined him in the Heartbreakers crew. They were pretty big in Gainesville, where they were from, but their music didn't quite make it big with the mainstream crowd. They laid down some tracks at the church studio in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but their only single, Depot Street, didn't really make an impact when it dropped in 1975. When Mud Crutch split, Petty wasn't too keen on going solo, but he eventually gave it a shot. Meanwhile, Tench put together his own band, and Petty dug their sound. Eventually, they all came together, including Ron Blair and Stan Lynch, to form the first lineup of the Heartbreakers. Their self-titled debut album initially didn't get famous in the United States, but it gained some traction in Britain. After touring with Niels Lofgren, their songs American Girl and Breakdown climbed to number 40 on the charts when they re-released the latter in 1977. This first album came out under Shelter Records, which was being distributed by ABC Records at the time. However, their second album, You're Gonna Get It, was a big game changer. It hit the top 40 and gave them a glimpse of chart success. It featured tracks like I Need to Know and Listen to Her Heart. After this, it was their third album, Damn the Torpedoes, that really shot them to the heights of fame. This one went platinum, selling nearly 2 million copies. It had all the hits like Don't Do Me Like That, Here Comes My Girl, Even the Losers, and Refugee. Then, in September 1979, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers hit the stage at a concert called Musicians United for Safe Energy, held at Madison Square Garden in Manhattan. They played with their rendition of Cry to Me, which got featured on the album called No Nukes that came out of the event. Their fourth album, 
Hard Promises, dropped in 1981 and was a big hit, landing in the top 10 charts and going platinum. The smash single, The Waiting, was a real crowd-pleaser. Plus, it marked Petty's first duet, Insider, with none other than Stevie Nicks. After that, things changed a bit when bass player Ron Blair left the group. Howie Epstein stepped in for the next album, Long After Dark, which was released in 1982. It featured the hit You Got Lucky and marked the beginning of a lineup that stuck around until 1994. In 1985, the band played at Live Aid and performed four killer tracks at John F. Kennedy Stadium in Philadelphia in front of nearly 90,000 fans. Their album, Southern Accents, also dropped in 1985 and had the chart-topping single Don't Come Around Here No More, produced by Dave Stewart. The music video for that song was pretty wild, as it showed Petty dressed up as the Mad Hatter chasing down Alice from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Eventually, that album tour led to another live album called Pack Up the Plantation, Live, but that wasn't the end of it. Bob Dylan himself invited Petty and his group to join him on his True Confessions tour, hitting up Asia, Oceania, and North America. In 1986 and 87, they shared the stage with the Grateful Dead, jamming out together. Right after that, they dropped another album, Let Me Up I've Had Enough, which featured the song Jammin' Me, a collaboration with Dylan himself. Petty's eventual solo career. In 1988, Tom got together with some pretty big names in music like George Harrison, Bob Dylan, Roy Orbison, and Jeff Lynne. Together, they created the Traveling Wilburys. Their first track, which was titled Handle With Care, was originally supposed to be a B-side for one of Harrison's singles, but it was just too good to be a sidekick. So they decided to go all out and record a full album called Traveling Wilburys Volume 1. Then, in 1990, they came out with another album, but this time they did things a bit differently and called it Traveling Wilburys Volume 3. Why? Well, apparently some sneaky people were out there selling bootleg studio sessions as Traveling Wilburys Volume 2, so they decided to mess with them a bit. Petty loved all the songs that he created with the Wilburys and even performed them in his live shows. Some of his all-time favorite, when it came to performances, included Handle With Care and End of the Line. The same year, in 1989, Petty released Full Moon Fever, which was his first solo album technically. Even though it was all his own creation, he had some very talented people backing him up, like Mike Campbell, Jeff Lynne, Roy Orbison, and George Harrison. Hits like I Won't Back Down, Free Fallin', and Running Down a Dream were born from that album, but something even bigger was about to happen. In 1991, Petty and the Heartbreakers reunited and created Into the Great Wide Open, which was a massive hit. Lynne co-produced it, and it featured chart toppers like Learning to Fly and Into the Great Wide Open. The best thing about these was Johnny Depp and Faye Dunaway made appearances in the music video for Into the Great Wide Open. However, there's more. Before parting ways with Music Corporation of America Records, Petty and his gang hit the studio one last time to record two new songs for a greatest hits package. Mary Jane's Last Dance and Thunderclap, Newman's Something in the Air became the fans' all-time favorites. This was also the last time Stan Lynch performed with the Heartbreakers, which was pretty bittersweet. The package ended up selling over 10 million copies, earning them diamond certification by the Recording Industry Association of America, Tom at the Warner Brothers Records. In 1989, Tom Petty, still under contract with Music Corporation of America, snuck away and inked a deal with Warner Brothers Records. That's where the Traveling Wilburys were signed, and eventually, his first album with them came out in 1994. It was called Wildflowers and became his second solo gig. Just like the last one, Wildflowers was full of hits. There's the title track, You Don't Know How It Feels, You Wreck Me, It's Good To Be King and A Higher Place. Rick Rubin produced that album, and it flew off the shelves, selling over 3 million copies just in the United States. Then, in 1996, Petty and the Heartbreakers came out with a soundtrack for the movie titled She's the One, with Cameron Diaz and Jennifer Aniston. They had some pretty solid tracks on it like Wall's Circus with Lindsey Buckingham, Climb That Hill, and even a cover of Beck's A Asterisk Asterisk Hole. Plus, they also performed with Johnny Cash on his album Unchained. They called themselves Petty Cash for that one, and Cash even got a Grammy for Best Country Album with it. Later on, Cash returned the favor, covering Petty's I Won't Back Down on his album American 3 Solitary Man. In 1999, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers created their album Echo. But this wasn't just any album. This was their final album with Ruben in charge. It hit number 10 on the US album charts, so it was clearly a hit. 
Then, after 9-11, there was a big benefit concert. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers were there, and they sang I Won't Back Down. It was a powerful moment, and the next year they honored their partner, George Harrison, at the concert for George. They played Taxman, I Need You, and Handle With Care. Jeff Lynne, Donnie Harrison, and Jim Keltner even joined in for that last one. Then came 2002, and Patty dropped The Last DJ, an album where he basically took a jab at the music industry's shady practices. The title track was all about how radio DJs lost their freedom to pick songs for their stations. The album did very well, hitting number 9 on the Billboard 200 chart in the United States. Then, in 2005, Petty began his own show called Buried Treasure on XM Satellite Radio. This meant that the audience got to hear Tom's songs straight from his personal record stash which was quite appealing. Fast forward to 2006, and Petty and the Heartbreakers were headlining the Bonnaroo Music and Arts Festival. It was part of their 30th anniversary tour, and they had some serious talent join them on stage. Great musicians like Stevie Nicks, Pearl Jam, the Allman Brothers Band, and more were there, and Stevie even belted out Stop Dragging My Heart Around with Petty and the group. Then, just a month later, Petty went solo with Highway Companion. It had a hit called Saving Grace that almost made it to the top of the charts. It debuted at number 4 on the Billboard 200, which was Petty's best spot since they started tracking album sales in 1991. He even threw some songs from the album into the mix during the Heartbreakers tour that year. After that came the summer of 2007, and Petty decided to get his group back together. He got back together with his old partners, Tom Leiden and Randall Marsh, along with Heartbreakers Ben Montench and Mike Campbell, to revive his pre-Heartbreakers band, Mud Crutch. They went into the studio and created 14 tracks, which dropped on April 29, 2008. If you pre-ordered the album on iTunes, you even got a bonus track called Special Place. After this adventure, the band went up to California for a quick tour in the spring of 2008 to support the album. In the same year, Petty and the Heartbreakers contributed their talents to a tribute album for Fats Domino called Going Home. Their cover of I'm Walkin' not only paid homage to a legend, but also helped out students in New Orleans public schools by buying them instruments. Plus, it contributed to rebuilding efforts in the Hurricane Katrina hit Ninth Ward. Then, on February 3, 2008, Petty and the Heartbreakers performed at the halftime show at Super Bowl 42. They performed classics like American Girl, I Won't Back Down, Free Fallen, and Running Down a Dream. That same summer, they hit the road across North America, with Steve Winwood joining them as the opening act. Winwood even got onto stage with Petty and the group for some killer collaborations, like his Spencer Davis group hit Gimme Some Lovin'. Then, in November 2009, they dropped a boxed set called The Live Anthology packed with live recordings spanning from 1978 to 2006. After that came the band's 12th album, Mojo, which hit the shelves on June 15, 2010. It got as high as the number two spot on the Billboard 200 chart. Petty described it as a bit bluesy, with some longer jam-like songs. He even said a couple of tracks had that Allman Brothers feeling going on. To get things started, they performed as musical guests on Saturday Night Live in May 2010. Of course, they didn't skip out on hitting the road for a North American summer tour to promote the record as well. Now, here's where things went a bit wrong. Before they got onto the road, someone swiped five of their guitars, including two of Petty's own, from their practice space in Culver City, California, back in April 2010. Luckily, the Los Angeles Police Department came to save the day and recovered the goods a week later. Then came 2012, and it was a game changer. They hit the road for a world tour, which was a pretty big deal. They even swung by Europe for the first time in 20 years and made their debut in Canada's Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and Labrador provinces. Then, on July 28, 2014, Reprise Records published their 13th studio album, Hypnotic Eye. This one skyrocketed to number one on the Billboard 200 chart becoming their first album to ever snag that spot. Plus, in November 2015, they launched the Tom Petty radio channel on Sirius XM to stay connected with their fans. The Heartbreakers soon celebrated their 40th anniversary in 2017 by going on a massive tour across the United States. Things began on April 20th in Oklahoma City, and everything was wrapped up on September 25th with a grand finale at the Hollywood Bowl in California. This Hollywood Bowl show turned out to be their swan song, and they closed it out with a rendition of American Girl. 
However, the surprises still weren't over yet. On September 28, 2018, Reprise Records came out with an American treasure a massive box set that featured 60 whole tracks. It was like diving deep into Petty's musical journey with previously unreleased recordings, alternate versions of classics, rare gems, historic live performances, and more. The cherry on top was that they teased us with the first single, Keep a Little Soul, back in July 2018, but it was originally recorded during the Long After Dark sessions way back in 1982. However, music wasn't the only thing Tom was good at. Tom's acting career. In 1978, Tom made his film debut with a cameo in FM, after which he scored a small role in Made in Heaven in 1987, and even popped up in a few episodes of its Gary Shandling show from 1987 to 1990, playing himself as one of Gary Shandling's neighbors. Tom also made appearances on his other show, The Larry Sanders Show, and there's one episode where he almost ends up having a heated competition with Greg Kinnear after getting bumped from the show. Then, in 1997, he showed up in The Postman, which was directed by and starred Kevin Costner, playing the Bridge City Mayor. From the dialogue, it sounds like he's playing a future version of himself, but it gets even better than that. In 2002, Tom lent his voice and likeness to The Simpsons in an episode called How I Spent My Strummer Vacation. He's in there with Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Lenny Kravitz, Elvis Costello, and Brian Setzer just hanging out with Homer Simpson. Petty's character even schools Homer on writing lyrics and then loses a toe in a riot. After that, from 2004 to 2009, Petty voiced Elroy Lucky Kleinschmidt in the animated masterpiece, King of the Hill. Then came 2010, and Tom made a very small cameo with comedian Andy Samberg in a musical video called Great Day. It was part of the Lonely Island's bonus digital versatile disc for their album Turtleneck and Chain. Apart from entertainment, though, Tom was involved in a lot of other things, a huge part of which was activism. Advocacy for artistic control. If there's one thing Petty was passionate about, it was holding on to his creative freedom. Back in 1979, when ABC Records got absorbed by Music Corporation of America Records, he wasn't on board with any of it. They wanted to move him to another label without asking him first, so he took matters into his own hands and filed for bankruptcy. He landed a deal with Music Corporation of America's new creation, Backstreet Records, but only after making sure his terms were met. Then, in 1981, when the Music Corporation of America tried hiking up the price of his upcoming album, Hard Promises, Petty had some major issues with it once again. They wanted to slap an extra dollar on top of the usual price tag. He spoke up in the press, and fans rallied behind him. It was a whole thing, but eventually, the Music Corporation of America backed down. Petty wasn't about to let anyone mess with his fans or his music's value. Just like that, in 1987, he took tire giant Benjamin Franklin Goodrich to court for using a song that sounded a bit too much like his own in a television commercial. Even though they had been denied permission before, they went ahead and used it anyway. Petty made sure they knew that they had messed up, and eventually they settled out of court. There was also a time when George Bush wanted to use I Won't Back Down for his 2000 presidential campaign, and Petty shut that down real quick because he wasn't about to let his anthem be used for something he didn't believe in. His family carried on that legacy in 2020 when they put the kibosh on Donald Trump using the same song. They made it clear, Petty's music was all about love, not hate. However, there were several other moments when Petty's music felt a bit too familiar to others. When the Red Hot Chili Peppers came out with Danny California, people thought it sounded too much like Petty's Mary Jane's Last Dance. However, Petty didn't think that it was intentional. He figured it's just one of those things in rock and roll where songs can sound alike. He even mentioned how the Strokes copied his vibe for last night and owned up to it in an interview. Petty just brushed it off saying there are enough petty lawsuits out there already. Then, in 2015, when Sam Smith's Stay With Me raised a few eyebrows for sounding similar to Petty's I Won't Back Down, Petty and his partner Jeff Lynn got a slice of the pie. They managed to snag 12.5% of the royalties each, and their names got added to the song credits. However, Petty wasn't mad, and he knew stuff like that happens sometimes in music. He even praised Smith's team for being cool about it and sorting things out like adults. Apart from his career, though, his personal life was also a roller coaster full of ups and downs. Tom's personal life. 
In the beginning, Tom had a rocky relationship with his dad, who didn't quite get his love for the arts. Instead, he dealt with verbal and physical abuse from him. However, he was close to his mom and his brother, Bruce. Eventually, Tom got married to Jane Benyo back in 1974. They had two daughters, Adria and Anakim. Interestingly, Stevie Nicks once misheard Benyo's accent and got inspired to write Edge of Seventeen. Sadly, things didn't work out between Petty and Benyo, and they split in 1996. Then there was a crazy incident in 1987 when an arsonist set fire to Tom's house in Encino, California. Thankfully, the firefighters managed to save his basement studio and the tape stored there. But his iconic gray top hat was gone forever, turned to ash. The culprit was never caught and it still stands as one of the greatest mysteries ever. Alongside that, Petty had his own battles too. After his split from Benyo, he found himself wrestling with a heroin addiction. It was a tough time, fueled by the emotional fallout from the divorce. However, he didn't let it beat him and checked into rehab in 1999 and got clean. He even credited his girlfriend at the time, Dana York, with helping him turn things around. Then came the love story part two. Petty and York got married in Vegas in 2001, with a second ceremony at their Malibu home a few weeks later. Little Richard officiated the wedding, and they had an all-female mariachi band playing the songs. York had a son from a previous marriage, Dylan, so they became one big happy family. Aside from all that, Petty had always been into transcendental meditation. He talked about how much it helped him out in 2014. Soon, though, Petty ended up facing the inevitable, his death. On October 1st, 2017, Tom's wife, York, found him in bad shape at their place. He wasn't breathing and had gone into cardiac arrest. It was a serious situation, but they managed to resuscitate him and rush him to the University of California Los Angeles Medical Center in Santa Monica. He remained on life support for a while, but unfortunately he passed away around 8.40 p.m. on October 2nd. During this time, false reports kept emerging throughout the day, making it even more surreal. Then, on October 16th, they held a memorial service for him at the Self-Realization Fellowship Lake Shrine in Pacific Palisades, Los Angeles. It was just four days before what would have been his 67th birthday. However, later on, things got even heavier. In January 2018, the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner revealed Petty's death wasn't natural. It was because of an accidental overdose. They found a mix of opioids like fentanyl, oxycodone, and others in his system, along with benzodiazepines and antidepressants. Turns out, Petty was dealing with some serious medical issues, like emphysema and a fractured hip, and was taking pain medication for them. His wife and daughter put out a statement saying the pain was just too much to handle, and it led to him overdoing it with the medicine. Sadly, Petty had been putting off the hip surgery that his doctors recommended for a while. He had this idea that his last tour was coming up, and he wanted to make sure he gave it his all for his group and fans who'd been with him for decades. Just the day before he passed, he was feeling proud and hopeful about what was to come, but life had other plans. However, Petty's achievements never went to waste. Tom's Accomplishments in 1994, there was an entire tribute album called You Got Lucky, which featured bands like Everclear and Silkworm paying homage to Petty. Then, in April 1996, the University of California, Los Angeles, gave him the George Gershwin and Ira Gershwin Award for Lifetime Musical Achievement. Later, in 1999, Petty and the Heartbreakers scored a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But that wasn't all. In December 2001, they got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as well. Rolling Stone ranked him 91st on their list of the greatest artists of all time, and in 2005, he received the Billboard Century Award. Years later, in 2017, Petty was honored as Musicare's Person of the Year for his incredible contributions to music and his philanthropy efforts. After he passed away that same year, his hometown Gainesville paid tribute to him by painting a mural on the Southwest 34th Street wall. It was a heartfelt gesture to their hometown hero. On what would have been his 68th birthday in October 2018, Gainesville renamed a park that Petty used to frequent as a kid to Tom Petty Park. Just when you thought that was it, in December 2021, the University of Florida awarded Petty with an honorary Doctor of Philosophy. Three of his albums made it to Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time list, including Wildflowers, Damn the Torpedoes, and Full Moon Fever. Plus, two of his songs, American Girl and Free Fallen, made it to the 500 Greatest Songs of All Time list. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.